Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us for tonight's event with author Jim Tobin, presented by University of Michigan Press. We'll be watching for audience questions throughout the event. If you're on Zoom, please submit your questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom center of the screen. And if you're watching on Facebook, please let us know your question in a comment. You can turn captions on or off using the live transcript button in Zoom at the bottom right side of the screen. We'll be recording the event this evening, and we'll share it on our Facebook page later this week. I am very pleased to introduce author Jim Tobin. Jim teaches literary, literary journalism and narrative history in the Department of Media, Journalism, and Film at Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. He earned his PhD in history at the University of Michigan and worked for 12 years as a reporter for the Detroit News. Jim is also author of several books on U.S. history, including Ernie Powell's War, which won the National Book Critics Circle Award. Over the past 25 years, Jim has been a core contributor to several University of Michigan initiatives focused on relating stories from the school's 200-year history, including the University of Michigan Heritage Project. Tonight, we'll be discussing Jim's most recent book, Sing to, Sing to the Colors, which considers ideas of place, tradition, legacy, and pride while investigating two centuries of history at U of M. The book's 23 essays capture a series of moments, some well-known and celebrated, others inconspicuous or even troubling, that have contributed to the ongoing evolution of the university. Readers travel back to bitter battles over the vision for the university in its early years and learn how the Diag and other campus landmarks came to be. Other chapters consider milestones on the university's continuing journey toward greater inclus inclusivity, such as the 1970 Black Action Movement strike and the enrollment of Michigan's first female students in the 1870s. Still other stories illuminate the complex relationship between the university and the city of Ann Arbor, revisiting former mainstays like the Pretzel Bell and Drake's Sandwich Shop. Alongside these stories, Jim grapples with his own understanding of and connection to Michigan's history, which, whatever its imperfections and errors, has shaped the lives of thousands of alums around the world. Jim, thank you so much for being with us this, this evening. I know that you had planned on reading an excerpt or two from the book, but before we sort of dive into that, I hope we could talk a little bit about the origins of Sing to Colors, how it came to be, both the individual stories and the concept of bringing them together. Well, of course, uh, Scott, you had a lot to do with that latter part, and um, thanks an awful lot to you and the University of Michigan Press for having me to talk about it. So the, um, as you said, I got involved a number of years ago in writing uh, uh, about the history of the university. I was working as a freelance writer, and um, I thought it would be good if a couple of the regular U of M publications would um, cover the, the, the subject regularly. And so I pitched that idea to um, a friend of mine who was then the editor of Michigan Today, the Alumni Monthly, uh, John Lothi, and he said, yeah, let's give it a try. So um, I began to write those pieces month by month, got interested, one piece led to another. Um, and then as the bicentennial of the university was approaching, um, that, that was, as everyone remembers, uh, celebrated in 2017. Back in 2013, plans were getting underway. And so I got involved in a, in a, in a project that would uh, bring longer stories uh, of the same type to the web um, in a, a website called the University of Michigan Heritage Project, which is still very much up and running and, and uh, uh, stories keep get, getting added to it. I think there are more than 100 stories on that site now. Uh, so that led to a number of the longer stories that appear here in the book. And so after the bicentennial, um, at some point you and I met and spoke and uh, uh, as much as people read things on the web these days, I'm old fashioned enough to, to want to have my writing if possible between, uh, uh, between covers. And so um, we talked about the idea of a collection of pieces and worked on that together. And, and uh, lo and behold, this is the book that emerged from that process. And I, I recall from some of those early conversations, Jim, that um, something you really wanted to capture was the importance of the university as a place um, and of actually being on a campus to kind of student growth. Could you, you know, talk a little bit about that, how you see that and particularly I remember in those early conversations talking about um, how the pandemic had sort of changed our views of the importance of place at a university. 
Yeah, you know, uh, we, we were, for, for the last number of years, we've been seeing the growth of massive online courses uh, offered by um, faculty members at, at uh, you know, a, a number of prestigious universities. And people started to say, well, why do we have to have individual places where students go? Why can't all of this work be conducted online? And that was, that's been a very appealing prospect to a lot of people, especially those who think about saving money on dorms and, and uh, you know, groundskeeping and all the things that go into maintaining a residential university. And then the pandemic hit and suddenly all classes uh, were online at Michigan, at, at Miami of Ohio where I teach and pretty much everywhere else. And I think everyone instantly realized that, that although there, there are opportunities for teaching online that, that makes sense and can be used, um, there's just something different about being physically in the same space. Um, and, and so the, the idea of the in-person classroom suddenly is sort of, I, I, think, uh, I, I, I think we all realized um, just the great value of, of being uh, together. Uh, in, in the places where teaching happens. Um, and of course, a great deal of research depends on being in person with each other too. These are communities that, that, that uh, bring about discoveries in the sciences and, and um, it's, it's just important to, to be in a particular place. Not to mention the fact that, 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 that these places take on enormous meaning for um, the students who, who go to college for four years in that place and develop enormous attachments. You know, the, the, the passage from adolescence to adulthood is when we go to college. And that's the most, for many of us, the most intense period of our lives. And it becomes associated with that, with that place. So um, it's just hard for many of us who have had a good experience in college and lucky enough to go to, it, it, it's just hard to imagine not having a place like that to be attached to. And I think something that, um, comes through the stories in this book is the role that all the different hands that kind of came together to shape the place that the University of Michigan is today. Um, and the same thing happens at universities around the country, of course. Um, and I, I wonder if that's something else that goes away in that online environment where students have less of a role yeah. in kind of creating their own journey. That, that that's true, and um, it, you're right that one of the points that, that 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 we tried to make in the book, with the inclusion of certain stories, was just how big a role students have played in shaping the culture, the 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 the, the physical place itself. Um, uh, you know, the whole um, so many aspects of the experience of of college at Michigan have been shaped by students and. Um, a number, a number of the stories really emphasize that, and 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 so without that, without the, the, the students being there, um, they're sort of at the mer mercy of faculty and administrators, um, who um, uh, you know uh, obviously have their critical roles to play in the college experience. Um, but it's not the same if if they're calling all of the shots. Well, I, I think this might be a, a good juncture, Jim, to jump into one of the stories and uh, and give the audience a taste of, of what it's like. Um, would you mind reading a bit from Sink sure. to the College for us? Sure, yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to, to do that. Um, chose a, a story um, that we called Rhapsodies in Blue, and it's about the uh, the way in which the color blue became, you know, such an integral part of, of U of M. Um, I'm going to read just a, a little intro to the piece, and then I'm going to cut over and skip a couple of pages in the interest of time. Uh, so I'll just start this way. One day, Deborah Holdship, my editor at Michigan Today, forwarded an, an email to me. It was sent by one Bob Neer, class of 1951, who told Deborah, quote, you must tell alumni how Go Blue came about. Well, that was intriguing. So I pulled on that thread and discovered not one or even two tales about, quote, how Go Blue came about. 
and wrote a romp through the whole business of Michigan Blue in its most famous manifestations. Now, the early part of the story, uh, I deal with the, 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 the very beginnings of, of how Michigan embraced blue and yellow, or as we all know it, maize as the, as the school's colors. One thing I'll, I just want to show folks who are watching is this postcard from, I think, the 1890s. We found this at the Bentley Historical Library. Here's this young lady decked out in blue uh, sitting atop the uh, University of Michigan seal, which you'll notice has a different um, uh, year at the bottom, 1837, instead of the one we know, 1817, thereby uh, uh, hangs another long story that I've written. But the interesting thing about this picture is how the blue is really the sky blue or azure that people in the early decades thought of as Michigan blue. It changed to the shade of navy that we use now uh, only over time. So um, I thought that'd be fun to show. There's a whole huge postcard collection at the Bentley Library with, with U of M postcards and lots of other ones from the state especially too. So uh, let me read um, the part of the story that deals with the great um, Let's Go Blue Cheer, which is what Bob Neer had been writing to us about to begin with. It's hardly surprising that Bob Neer couldn't remember every detail of that long ago Michigan hockey game. It had been nearly 70 years after all. He couldn't remember the exact date or even whom Michigan was playing, but he did remember what his roommate, Paul Fromm, did that night, which means that Bob Neer was pretty surely an eyewitness to the moment when the word blue was given its most famous usage in America. It happened on a cold night in the winter of 1950-51. Near, a native of Queens, New York, was a senior in business. His buddy, Paul Fromm, was a senior in engineering from Buffalo, New York. They were serious students, not rah-rah types, but now and then they would get dinner at the old German or the pretzel bell, and then trudge down to the Coliseum to watch a varsity hockey game. Those games were not like Michigan hockey today, with thousands of raving fans crammed up to the ceiling of Yost Arena, formerly the Yost Fieldhouse. Admission was free. You sat wherever you wanted in the Coliseum bleachers. Brom was a good guy, Nier said, quote, independent, very smart. He was a fun guy, but he was not a backslapper, ha 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 kind of guy, very serious student. So the Wolverines were out on the ice against somebody or other, hustling up and down the rink. Fans were watching and cheering for this or that, the usual thing. And then, with no preface or pronouncement of any kind, Paul Fromm stood up. Quote, he felt good about Michigan, and up he went, Near said. I think it was absolutely spontaneous. And Fromm shouted two words with a pause in between. Go! Blue! And then he shouted the words again and again. At first, people nearby just looked up at Fromm and laughed a little. Nobody had heard anybody say that before. Everybody knew, of course, that Michigan's colors were maize and blue, but nobody yelled, go blue. Go Michigan, sure, but not go blue. Fromm kept going. After a minute, people began to pick it up. It became a crowd chant, two words over and over in rhythm, go. Blue, go, blue. Bob Neer was chanting along. It was absolutely amazing how two words like that would elicit so much emotion from the crowd, Neer said. We were part of the team with go blue. One thing that's nice about it is that it's just two words. Any idiot can say two words. And after a while, Fromm sat back down, and that was that. Fromm went on to a successful career as an engineer at Bell Helicopter. He died a number of years ago. Near became an executive with Boeing Aircraft. Near can't remember if they did the cheer at other hockey games that year. He just knows that Go Blue is now heard at every Michigan sporting event and that it's the universal slogan of U of M lo loyalists everywhere. I just can't believe it, he said. It's all over the country now. So that's how Go Blue 
was coined, unless it wasn't. The thing is, in a 1998 letter to Michigan Today, Margaret Peg Detler Dungan, an Ann Arbor native, said that Paul Fromm, who was a friend of hers, was the inventor of Go Blue All Right, but she says Fromm first yelled the words not at a hockey game, but at the home football opener against Michigan State in the fall of 1950. A 14 to 7 loss, I'm sorry to say. So that clears that up. It was from, but earlier, at a football game, not a hockey game. Unless it wasn't. Because Charles J. Moss of Midland, Michigan, in another 1998 letter to Michigan Today, claims to have invented and introduced the Go Blue Cheer at U of M baseball game in the spring of 1947. He says the cheer was picked up at Michigan football games the following fall, and thus was history made. Not by Paul Fromm, not at a hockey game, not at a football game, not in 1950, not in 1951. As any historian will tell you, the past is seen at best through a glass darkly. The way Ken Burke remembers it, the conversion of Go Blue into a jingle that swept from Michigan Stadium to Hollywood started with some tuba players in the University of Wisconsin band. It happened sometime in the hockey season of 1973-74. Burke, a junior in the business school, was hanging out with a couple of friends in his apartment at the corner of Tappan and Oakland. One of them was Tom Blasky, a law student. He and Burke had both played tuba in the Michigan marching band. The other guy was Robbie Moore, a neighbor of Burke's. He was the All-American goalie on Michigan's hockey team. Moore always got a kick out of the pep bands that played at hockey games, and that night he got talking about a tune he'd just heard on a road trip to Madison. Burke and Blasky both remember what Moore said. There's this cool thing the Wisconsin hockey band does and he sang a catchy little tune that had stuck in his head with three, three staccato notes at the end. Bup, bup, bup. That was it. Ken Burke thought no more about it until the following fall when the marching band traveled to Madison. There, he heard the Wisconsin horns play that ditty with the bup, 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 the same one Robbie Moore had sung. A couple months later, Burke walked down to Yost Arena to see a hockey game. In the stands, he spotted the hockey pep band, a ragtag bunch of volunteers who pumped up the crowd with jingles and Michigan songs. Burke walked over to a tuba player he knew named Joe Carl, one of the pep band's unofficial organizers. He said, hey, Joe, give me your horn for a minute. And he played the little tune that Robbie Moore had sung in the apartment. Burke told Carl, you guys should play that. And then after the bup, 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 you could shout, let's go blue. And they did. Now, Joe Carl's memory of what happened is slightly different, but he remembers that Wisconsin's band was somewhere in the mix. The band traveled to Wisconsin for the football game, Carl told me. And the Wisconsin band, they're kind of rowdy, kind of interesting. And I do remember them doing something that ended with a bop, 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 you know? It was their sousaphones as they're marching into the stadium. We were waiting there to come in the stadium and here comes the Wisconsin band and they were doing something. I couldn't recognize what the piece was, but I do remember it ended with this bop, bop, bop. I remember hearing that. That something with the bup, bup, bup came back to Ann Arbor in his head, Carl said, and then to that hockey game at Yoast. I don't remember how that came around to Let's Go Blue, other than it was just kind of, they seemed to be goofing around, and then we started goofing around. And that certain tune began to pop out of Michigan tubas that night. Then, just after the bup, 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 if Joe Carl's memory serves, an alto horn player, named John Endall yelled, let's go blue. And the crowd loved it. Yeah, the crowd picked it up, absolutely, Carl said. And you get a crowd there in Yost Arena and it sounded like 10,000 people. It was really cool. It certainly caught us by surprise. By the following se football season, George Cavender, director of U of M bands, had heard the let's go blue tune and cheer and he loved it too. 
So one day he buttonholed Albert Ehrenheim, who had been the marching band's drum major. He was now Cavender's graduate assistant and the band's principal arranger, and he had studied with Jerry Billick, the U of M trained composer, arranger, and musical director who conceived M Fanfare. Cavender said, hey, Al, there's this tune that this tuba player has been playing at the hockey games, and it goes like this. Cavender sang it. I want you to do a full arrangement for the marching band. So Ehrenheim sat down at the piano and got to work, singing notes, playing notes, and scribbling on a blank score. Gradually, the arrangement emerged. He started with the original tuba bass line, those low thumping notes, and added trombones. Then he wrote a new melody to burst in at a higher octave, trumpets playing a scrambling Dixieland kind of thing. And then all the instruments ascended together into a riot of melody and counter melody, punctuated at the end with those three popping periods, bop, bop, bop. Ehrenheim got it down on paper. He handed it to Cavender, who looked it over and scribbled in the margin at the appropriate point, yell, let's go blue. It's arranging more than composition, Ehrenheim told me, but the two are intimately related. What I did was an arrangement based on this bass line. I came up with that new melody, so I guess that was composition, but I don't wanna to make too much of it. It's not Beethoven. Uh, maybe not, but it approached the half century mark with no signs of age. It was a Michigan calling card, of course, and, but it was also played all over the country. It popped up in movies from The Big Chill to Remember the Titans. In the credits of Titans, Carl and Ehrenheim are the very last names listed, thanks in part to George Cavender, who urged them to get the tune copyrighted. It's a lot of fun, there's no question, Ehrenheim said. I had no idea how much fun it was going to be. So, who gets the credit? It looks like everybody deserves a piece of it, small or large. Rob, Robbie Moore, Ken Burke, Joe Carl, Michigan's hockey fans, George Cavender, and Albert Ehrenheim. And maybe especially those tuba players at Wisconsin, even a Michigan loyalist would rather not admit it. Ken Burke's friend, Tom Blasky, put it this way. As they used to say about the Panama Canal, stolen, fair and square. And who's to say Wisconsin didn't swipe the tune from somebody else? That's how that ends. Thanks so much, Jim. Um, it, it, sort of a, a important part of that story at, at several junctures um, was a letter to the editor. And I'm, I'm sure you've gotten your fair share of readers writing in saying, hey, you know what you should really research and write on um, this story. Uh, do you have any examples of maybe kind of tales that you were a bit reluctant to dig into, but when you finally did, you said, maybe, maybe there is something here. It's true that it's true that readers have suggested a story or two that we wound up doing. Um, gosh, it, yes, I mean there are there are stories like that. The one that is popping into my head um, is the story about the Tappan Oak, which we which we did just a number of months ago. Uh, it's not in the book. I'm trying to think who who clued me into that but it's always it's always this little one thing leads to another we, we, we I knew of course that the Tappan Oak uh, was was uh, dying the foresters had, on campus had discovered the oak was dying and you know it's a massive it was a massive tree and there was a danger of limbs falling down onto the diag and hurting people and so uh, regrettable as it was it had to come down and um, then somebody wrote to me and said, gosh, I'm forgetting this, um, that there was a student who had collected a few years earlier acorns from the Tappan Oak. His folks lived in Saline, just a little way south of Ann Arbor. And he had gone to his parents' house out in the backyard. There was some, there was some room for this. And he, he planted these acorns from the Tappan Oak. They grew into seedlings and he put the seedlings in the ground and lo and behold, um, a couple of very healthy seedlings grew up um, in his folks' backyard. His, his father managed to um, cut down a couple of them uh, accidentally with his lawnmower, 
but a couple survived. And so now those um, are being replanted on the campus. Well, I just, when I heard about that, I said, we, we've got to write that. It was a little bit more contemporary journalism than it was history, um, but it did, it did allow us to talk about this venerated old wonderful tree uh, that grew on the campus for hundreds of years, preceded the campus. Um, it was an original from the, from the Michigan forest. When you come up with an idea for a story, not necessarily more of a contemporary one, but a historical episode that you want to dig into, where's your starting point typically, Jim? Um, it, it varies. Um, I've got a pretty good little library of U of M history books. And especially in the early years, I would be looking through those for background and I would, I would see a mention of a little incident that it seemed to me worthy of, you know, a full narrative. And so I would, I would pull it out and look into it. An example of that, I mentioned the University of Michigan seal. Um, uh, uh, there was um, reference to the, to the, to the seal. Um, and what the year was on the seal. And, the, and I realized that there had been a controversy about the founding date. Well, that, that grew into a big long story um, about a controversy that we, was waged um, or a fight that was waged in the 1920s over the, what, you know, what should we call the founding date of the University of Michigan? So um, I think it's an interesting story, but if I try to tell it now, uh, I'll get into these legal details that I barely remember and that are boring as hell. But um, uh, in the end, 1817, the date that the, the very first instance of the university was founded in the city of Detroit, that became known as the founding date. That's why we celebrated the bicentennial in 2017. So um, I think that came out of a reference in, in one of the uh, Michigan, the U of M histories. But sometimes too, it'll be just something I happen to see in the archives. You know, the, the archives of the university are stored at the Bentley Historical Library on North Campus where I've spent many, many days and hours. And sometimes, um, well, here's a good example. I was, I was looking up the, um, the oral history, the transcript of a, of a long oral history interview um, with a member of the law faculty. And I, that, that box came out to me on, into the reading room of the library. And I looked at, at, that, um, at that professor's oral history. I can't remember why I wanted to look at that one, but in the same box, there was the oral history of Yale Kamisar, who was one of the most famous members of the Michigan law faculty who died just a little while ago. Well, I got looking at that and I'd interviewed Kamisar once. He was this fiery personality, and I was curious about what he had said in this long oral history interview. Well, about two hours later, I put the thing down and I said, I've got to write a story about this. And that became one of the stories that I'm proudest of. That's in the book. So it's just the accident of picking up a particular document and, and seeing something interesting in it, and then pulling on that string and pulling and pulling and getting a story out of it. Wanted to pause briefly for a couple nice comments we've received from the audience. Uh, one from Barbara Beaton, who says, uh, not a question, but I could not love that postcard more, heading to the Bentley. <laughs> and another Barbara, from- Barbara Beaton, Barbara Beaton, a great University of Michigan librarian, um, uh, who uh, I, I must say, um, I won't give away her email address, but uh, she has one of the most uh, striking and easy to remember email addresses ever. Anyway, friend of mine. And a, uh, another uh, famous uh, University of Michigan figure called Carl uh, Grapentine says, for future reference, Albert uh, Arnheim pronounces his name Arnheim. Arnheim. So yeah. I, I believe uh, uh, Mr. Grapentine uh, was, was uh, mentioned in my interview with Albert Arnheim. I, I stand corrected and I thank you very much. I, I probably knew that at the time I was interviewing him. Well, moving along, Jim, um, you have a, a family full of Wolverines. Um, your, your parents went to the university, correct? And you have children who also went to the university? And, how, sorry, my wife. Mm -hmm. and your wife. Um, how has that sort of impacted your perspective on the university, particularly kind of over time as your, your kids went to U of M? 
Well, uh, that was the thing is that uh, I, I remember when both of my daughters chose U of M and we were, you know, moving them into the dorms and my younger daughter, Claire, moved into East Quad where I had lived as a freshman. There was, there was just a sense of, um, I can't, it's hard to put a name on it, but just the sense of tradition and, and legacy. Um, I had certainly felt it as a student myself, thinking about my, my folks being at Michigan in the late 1930s, and they had often told stories about the university. And, and so I, I knew their stories and, and treasured their stories. Um, about the about the dances that they went to, they met they met at Michigan, and so dances and J Hop, which was the reason for a story about the great senior dance J Hop that's in the book. Um, but somehow, when my daughters were there, I started to realize, boy, this 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 does this does impact me and 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 all the members of my family in this in this deep thing that we share. And it wasn't it wasn't so much about sports, although that's important for many families um, with several generations at the school. My my mom and dad were Michigan fans, but I grew up not much of a sports fan, and my daughters were not sports fans. So our our connections had more to do with uh, uh, oh, just day to day life on the campus, and 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 with the academics, um, which tends to tends to get forgotten when people are reminiscing about their time at U of M. Uh, that has meant a lot to me uh, because I went to graduate school at Michigan, got a PhD in history. Um, the, 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 the research side of the university came to have a great deal of meaning to me, my connections to my professors in the history department, uh, especially Sidney Fine uh, and Gerald Linderman and Shaw Livermore. So those figures played a big part in, in my life and um, you know everything that I've done since I went to Michigan. Jim, you've been working for the University of Michigan's communications department on the Heritage from, uh, Project for a long time, but I, I can't imagine anyone would ever accuse you of covering university history with sort of rose-tinted glasses. Um, virtually all of the stories about U of M history that you write mm -hmm. are not a straight line towards sort of some great outcome. Oftentimes, um, they're about people drafting uh, grappling with really difficult decisions and ultimately sometimes there are fairly disappointing outcomes and some that are from our perspective today probably even a bit shameful um is it difficult to write like that about the university where you spent so much time well it, it, uh, i would say no it, it has been difficult in fact it, 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 what would have troubled me is if is if we had gotten pressure to to write stories that only sort of glorified Michigan. My, my instincts are, you know, those of a journalist and a historian. And um, when I started doing this, um, you know, I spoke to editors about airing dirty, dirty laundry and writing things that would, that would seem critical about critical of the university. And to, I think to their great credit, Deborah Holdship and editor of Michigan Today Now, John Lofi, her predecessor, Kim Clark, um, who has supervised the Heritage Project and, and, and her superiors in the communications operation. They've all been, they've, they, they've all totally accepted that and, and, and um, understood that urge to, to write the bad with the good. I, I think that this has been in the spirit of an academic institution. Um, whose whole purpose is to seek the truth and not not to whitewash. So um, we haven't gotten we haven't gotten any pushback, um, and that's been really that's been really great. Some of the once in a while, an alumnus will read it and say, "I can't believe this is appearing in a University of Michigan publication," um, but the, uh, that has not been the general uh, reaction of alums to critical stories. They I think they get what we're doing and, and they appreciate it. Along that line, Jim, Sing to the Colors uh, actually ends with two stories that have um, sort of a, a, a complica complicated stories that um, ha deal with difficult issues, particularly related to diversity and inclusion at the university. Um, one on the BAM strikes and another on the secret society in Michigamwa. Um, 
could you talk us tell us a little bit about those stories give us a quick summary and also talk about why you decided to end the book with those chapters mm -hmm. um well they come in the part of the book that is called the world the students made um i had not in all that time uh, i had not that I've been writing about U of M history. I've never written about the BAM strike, which is one of the obviously the you know major events of the later 20th century at the at the university. Um, I think I'd shied away from it, not so much because of any feelings about it being controversial, but but because it would be so difficult. I knew it was a complicated story, and I knew also the sources were um, would be hard to come by. So um, what I tried to do was um, uh, tell, tell a story about the BAM strike using sources that, that, that reflected the impact that it had on the administration. Um, and that's, that's a complicated story. And I, I won't try and name all those factors. Robin Fleming as president had to deal with that and sort of generally thought to have handled it well in terms of Keeping um, uh, keep, <laughs> keeping law enforcement at bay, shall we say, and uh, at other campuses, um, police and sheriff's deputies cracked down on student protesters and and Fleming, and that 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 resulted in you know violent conflict in some in some places. Fleming uh, uh, made made sure that that didn't happen. That was a good thing. Um, but Bamstrick has a has a complicated legacy. The university, although committing the funds that it committed to to um, giving to for the purposes of financial aid to increase minority enrollment, um, uh, you know we we have not seen enrollment go to the levels that that um, everybody hoped that they would to, that they would in the, in the immediate years afterward. And then during the years of um, the Duderstadt administration, when significantly more resources were committed and the numbers did rise, um, that was great. But but then they fell off again um, after the state um, passed the referendum against affirmative action on co in college admissions decisions. So it's been a it's been a rough road, um, and the BAM strike is still seen as kind of a promise unkept. Uh, that is an oversimplification of what happened, but th there's something to it also. The story about Mishigama is, is about my own family's involvement. Um, many folks um, may not know what it was, may not remember it. It was a senior honorary, honorary society started at the beginning of the 20th century with a Native American theme. Um, uh, and um, uh, my father was a member uh, in the in the late uh, 30s, actually 40, 41. And then I briefly was a member in the 1970s. I had been co-editor of the Daily. And Michigama typically chose both uh, leading athletes and leaders of student organizations to become members. And so I was in it briefly, sponsored a resolution to admit women to the group and was voted down. And I quit just a, just a few days later for, again, a complicated series of a set of reasons. I thought this was an interesting story um, and the Michigan has been largely forgotten. So I wanted to write about it on my own feelings about what, what happens when the university does things that become discredited later. How, how do we come to terms with an organization like Michigan, which now, um, uh, is discredited and and uh, uh, seen as sort of a disreputable chapter in the university's history. So I'll just, I don't know, Scott, I'll have to, <laughs> there's no nutshell that that story fits into easily, but I try and explain my feelings about all of that and my experience with, with Michigama. And um, yeah, it just seemed like the end was, it was the right place to put that. It's the most personal of the stories. And so I think you and I agreed that it made a sort of nice coda for the whole book. Could you uh, talk, Jim, a little bit about your time at the uh, Michigan Daily? Um, and whether, 
you came to the university knowing you wanted to work on the daily, or is that something that uh, you, you discovered while you were already on campus and it kind of it took off from there? Well, I came to Michigan um, fall of 74, which is right after Richard Nixon's resignation and after the publication of Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein's book, All the President's Men, they, they, had, they had leaped to fame and, and um, journalism was, was sort of at a high point. And I, I had gotten the idea in high school that I thought I might like to be a journalist. And then that sort of Woodward and Bernstein momentum pushed me along in, into that idea. And so, I mean, the first week or two of school, I, I went into the uh, wonderful newsroom of the Michigan Daily on the second floor of the Student Publications Building on Maynard. And I was just in love from, from the first uh, time I went in there. Um, the, the Daily, like a lot of student organizations, you know, you think of the marching band, or the, the, the glee clubs, um, the drama groups has a way of sort of enfolding students in and, and that becomes your, uh, your fraternity, your sorority. It, it, it becomes the group you belong to and, and think of as your student family. That's the way it was for me. And the Daily has for a long, long time been a very good student newspaper. And so I, I learned most of what I knew about journalism from students at the at the daily. I, I, I was not a journalism major. I only took a couple of journalism courses. It was the daily where I, I learned um, how to be a reporter. Um, and I and and so and, and where I learned to be a writer. So that was that it, it really meant everything to me at uh, when I was an undergraduate. Jim, you're uh, currently in Ann Arbor resident and um, a couple times in the book it comes up the kind of issues of the sometimes symbiotic sometimes contentious relationship between the university and the city where it exists um, could you talk a little bit about that um, maybe there's a, a particular story from the book you think that um, touches on that well well I, I guess the the thing that um the book shows, uh, which is common sense in a way, and everybody kind of already knows this, but um, it's the it's the 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 the, the, the businesses, the the, the student, the, the establishments that cater to students that have shaped the you know the urban zone around the campus so much. Um, so there are stories in the book about Drake's, the great old candy shop, now gone. Uh, the original pretzel bell, which lasted for decades. Um, these and oh, another uh, one of my favorites is about Dominic's um, on uh, Monroe Street by the law school. Um, those those places, um, you know, not sponsored by the university. Uh, the, the, they grew up because of the university, and people have such strong associations with them. Thinking back on their time on campus. Um, you can't think of Ann Arbor without thinking of, of your favorite student haunts. And, and now I know, you know, my daughters frequented places that, that, uh, that are new. Um, in my view, you know, they're, they're, they're still new, even though they're maybe 30 years old now. And those become the places that, that they have such strong associations with. One, the, the story that sticks in my mind um, most about this is the story about Dominic's that I tell in the book. Um, shortly after I started teaching at Michigan, I was in a building, uh, my office was in a building down the hall from members of the mathematics department. And I met a guy in the mathematics department named Zevi Miller. And he learned that I had gone to Michigan, that I still lived in Ann Arbor. And he said, oh, well, how is Dominic's doing? And so we got talking about his time as a graduate student at Michigan, working on his PhD, and he didn't have much money. And uh, he, he, his, his favorite place to work on his, you know, amazingly obscure, difficult mathematical formulas and theories that he was working on was the basement space at Dominic's. And he would go down there, or he would, he would go into the counter, he would order one espresso, 
uh, or no, I think it was a mocha. And he would take his mocha down in the basement and sit there for three hours, hoping that the purchase of one mocha entitled him to that much time in this space. And uh, he, he said that Dominic Debardi, the, the founder and owner of Dominic's now gone, uh, would you know circulate. He would see him sitting there, never objected, never said, hey, fella, you better move along if you're not going to buy lunch or you're not going to buy any more mochas. Just let him sit there. And uh, so Zevi said that years later, he went to a Michigan football game and dropped by Dominic's. And Dominic's, uh, uh, Dom Devardi's son, who was running the place by then, was out in front and said he introduced himself, said, boy, you know, I wrote my whole dissertation in the basement down there. I used to see your dad. Um, and he would say hello, and we knew each other a little bit. And he said, oh, he's sitting out in back. Go, go see him. He's out in the garden. So Zevi goes out to the back, and there's Dom. And he puts out his hand and says, Mr. Debardi, I'm sure you won't remember me, but boy, I love coming to your place. And he looks, and Dom, Dom looks up and says, yeah, you, you're the guy who used to, he used to sit all afternoon in the basement with one mocha. <laughs> so he sure did remember. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, for, for me, um, you know, my, my wife and I have wonderful memories of going to Drake's for candy or to sit and have a limeade. Um, and, you know, my parents had gone on what they called Coke dates at Drake's in the 30s. So these places have a lot of resonance over the years. We have about uh, 10 minutes left in the event tonight. So if anyone has any questions, please do send those in and, uh, and we'll get right to them. Um, Jim, when we were working on the development of Sing to the Colors, I, you know, we had to make some really tough decisions about stories that didn't quite make the cut. Um, and I wondered if you could tell us a little bit about a couple that were really difficult for you not to kind of include in the final product. Boy, yeah, I should have, I should have thought about this. Um, I'll think about a couple of those stories. Oh, I know. Um, one was a story called The Lost Campus. Um, and that would have been, that, that, that story when it was online it depended in part on the, on the photographs that we were able to show. But I loved working on that story. It was about um, it's a whole series of spots on the campus that have either had buildings built over them or, you know, for one reason or another, have kind of disappeared or changed significantly. One of those places um, was, believe it or not, a little zoo uh, that was that that was behind, excuse me, the um, the Ruthven Museum's building. Now that space has been totally filled by um, the new, the new, you know, the additions to the administration building, or, which is where the administration now has its offices in that building. But there was a little zoo there with mostly Michigan animals. Um, there was a wolverine there for a little while. Now I, I don't think any zoo officials today would think that these animals were very humanely housed. Um, but it was a wonderful attraction, and I remember so many people writing in after we uh, originally published that story, um, saying, yes, they'd grown up in Ann Arbor, and they remembered going on field trips to the zoo from school and so forth. Um, another spot is called uh, Sleepy Hollow, uh, and that was a, 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 um, a part of the campus that is over on what is now the medical campus. You can still sort of see the contours of Sleepy Hollow. Uh, but in, in the early days, early decades, that was just sort of open field. And it was where a, an annual event called Cap Night was held, where thousands of students would come and congregate around a big bonfire. Um, and that's, you know, it's just not there anymore. And, and that, that event doesn't happen anymore. So sometimes I'll pass by you know, Mott Hospital, um, and I'll think, yeah, you know, in this space where lots of cars are parked now, once thousands of students gathered to sing and, and uh, uh, throw their caps in the air. Uh, let's see. Um, oh, another part of that story, The Lost Campus, was about the outhouses that used to be sprinkled around, around the campus um, in the days, in the decades before plumbing. 
um, you know, the first toilet on the campus was in the president's house. And when James Angel and his wife were lured um, uh, from New England to come out to this, this far western state of Michigan, uh, Mrs. Angel insisted that that, a, that a, a flush toilet be installed in the house, so that that was there. But before that, and most you know, for a long time after that, most people got along with big outhouses. And in fact, we have there's a wonderful picture of the Bentley Library, one of the big outhouses that was smack in the middle of the diag, and um, people depended on those. So, you know, the parts of campus that have vanished um, uh, are fascinating to me. Another story that, that didn't get into the book is about a part of the Arboretum that was called School Girls Glen. It's still called that. Um, and the, the story that I wrote was called The Vanishing of School Girls Glen. It's this lovely sylvan place at, at the west end of the Arboretum where, uh, you know, a glen is another word for a ravine. And so there's this long, um, uh, it's, it's really a, a stream bed that runs down through that part of the Arboretum. And it was, it was a place where lots of birds um, could be seen. So bird watchers would go there and at the different elevations, there would be different kinds of um, plant life too. And unfortunately that got, that got um, severely eroded by years of runoff from the building of the medical campus and all the pavement nearby. So there have been efforts to restore it, uh, which have been partly successful. But I, I was fascinated by that, um, just the change in the landscape caused by the building of the university. And the Arboretum is a great place, but we haven't always cared for it very well. Now I think we're doing a much better job. So there are a couple of examples of things that didn't get in. Well, I guess another question I have, Jim, um, I don't wanna say what's your favorite piece, but uh, maybe what uh, piece, not necessarily in the book, but uh, on the history of the university, did you find the most fun to research and write? Um, or maybe what, what piece most surprised you as you were working on it? Uh, there is a, a favorite piece of mine. Oh, okay. it, it, it runs against the grain um, of <laughs> the way most Michigan alums, most Michigan people feel, you know, uh, people, uh, have a deep allegiance to the to the football team and the basketball team and, and all the sports programs and you know I confess I live I live near the stadium and when I hear the victors which I can hear on Saturday afternoons I, I, there's a little thrill in my in my uh, chest um, so I'm not immune to the to the um, I'm not immune to fandom but I found out about um, a, a, an effort to oppose the building of Michigan Stadium in the 1920s. And it was led by a guy who was then a young student, um, Neil Stabler, who went on to become a very important politician in Michigan. He and um, Robert Cooley Angel, a, a young sociologist on the faculty who was the grandson of James Burl Angel, um, kind of got up a campaign against the building of, of the stadium. This was a time when many universities were uh, building new stadiums. Football was in this great period of growth and growing fandom. And so Fielding Yost, of course, um, was the sponsor of building this great new, great new stadium um, as football coach and athletic director. Well, Stabler and, and uh, Angel were against it. And so Stabler was the editor of a little, um, a little student magazine uh, that existed then called The Chimes. And so a, a, a number of editorials over a number of months appeared opposing the stadium. Maybe Scott, I could read just a little quote from Stabler's main editorial. That'd that was be great. Um, uh, Angel had already published in the Chimes, his, his main essay, his main attack on the stadium. So I, so I write this. Um, on October 20th, the Chimes carried Neil Stabler's own essay titled Stadium Mania. He began by saying the stadium debate amounted to competing theories of, quote, what college should be, unquote. Opponents of a giant stadium, he wrote, quote, conceive college to be primarily a place for those who are interested in study, a place in which distraction shall be minimized. 
The other view, sponsored by convivial alumni and accepted by what is unquestionably a majority of students, was that college is a place to acquire a minimum amount of knowledge and technical skill required to earn a fair living at a minimum sacrifice of amusement and pleasure. A construction of a giant stadium, he said, would be a monumental endorsement of the latter view. It would be, quote, a dedication of Michigan to the proposition that sport, which is the representative college amusement, deserves even a greater place in the minds and lives of students, alumni, and the public than it now occupies. Let's get down to the payoff point here. <clears throat> Finally, uh, Stabler said, quote, Michigan, by building a larger stadium, will be setting its stamp of approval upon an institution and a set of conditions inimical, in inimical to its own best interests. It will be a permanent concession set in concrete for years to come to the notion that college is nothing more than a Roman holiday. Well, I thought that was pretty extraordinary, and uh, it, it expressed a lot of my own views about the overemphasis on sports that that exists at, at places like Michigan. I know that I'm a tiny minority and, and will always fight a losing battle on this score, uh, but I do believe those things. I will say that after the story was first published online, um, Neil Stabler's, one of Neil Stabler's grandsons, Ned Stabler, who was a good guy who I've met, uh, wrote and said, well, be that as it may, I just want you to know my grandfather was a season ticket holder and took me to many games when I was a young boy and loved Michigan football. So I'm sure that's true too. So there you go. <laughs> well, Jim, we're just about out of time. Um, I wanted to turn to the last question we've been asking every single author who comes on um, our book of the month event. And that's what, are, what have you been reading lately? I've got two books to recommend. Uh, one that I've been um, lucky enough to teach in a course in narrative history at Miami. And the book is uh, Isabel Wil Wilkerson's The Warmth of Other Suns. This is the cover for folks to see. There we are. Uh, this is a massive piece of narrative history about the Great Migration, the migration of Black people from the American South to the to the East, North, North and West, starting around the 1910s and, and continuing on uh, through the 1960s and 70s. And um, it takes the it takes three main characters and follows their stories. It is just an extraordinary book that that has immensely uh, enlarged my view of um, how the country became what it is now. Uh, so I, I recommend that wholeheartedly. Um, I uh, love books about writing and have too many of them. Uh, but one of them that I just got recently, it's a new book uh, I'd like to recommend <clears throat> for folks interested in writing. It's this book, uh, it's called Murder Your Darlings by Roy Peter Clark, who is a journalist, uh, academic, a scholar of journalism and writing at uh, the Pointer Institute in Florida. Murder Your Darlings is a writing book about writing books. So every chapter, uh, is devoted to a particular writing book that uh, a piece of a, a book of writing advice that that Clark loves, and he does a lovely job of introducing you to the to the book. And and uh, he's, he's uh, some of them I uh, already knew about, already have read, but some of them are totally obscure I never heard of, and so it's led me to new discoveries in that in that realm. So two two books that I've liked a lot lately. Thank you. And we'll be sure to put um, those titles onto our Facebook page so people can check them out. Uh, well, th thank you so much for being with us, Jim. Uh, where, where can people go to check out what you're working on? Um, well, I have a website that is called uh, 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 James Tobin Writes, uh, all one word. And so uh, folks can find out a little bit more about my other books there. Um, and uh, that, that's the best place to look. Terrific. Well, thank you everyone for being with us this evening. Uh, Jim's book, Sing to the Colors, is on sale through the end of the month. Uh, just go to the University of Michigan Press website, uh, use the discount code UMGL13SING, and we'll throw that into the chat at checkout, and you can get it for just $13 with free shipping. That's through the end of September. Thank you again for being with us, Jim, and for everyone who attended, and have a great evening.
Thanks a lot, Scott. Good night, everyone.